So welcome everybody. Today we have a very special group of folks on from, these are my, I guess my best friends in the, uh, the hunting industry. Do you guys think I'm a friend? Absolutely. My best friend, uh, of course. Brinker. Okay. Yes. Thanks guys. That makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel so good. <laughs> we have, we have in the bottom right corner, we have the one and the only Ryan Lampers with the most beautiful flowing hair in the hunting industry. Yes. The Thanks luscious that, locks. Dave. Thanks for that. And in the bottom left, we have Gritty, who looks very tan, by the way. Did you just get back from Mexico? I was in Montana. It was brutal. Oh, yeah. I think that, it's closer to the sun. Summit, the, I don't know. The Western, like hunting, the Western hunting, hunting Summit this year was, uh, and we got a little bit of rain there, right, Lampers? But it was pretty, pretty warm. Yeah, we had our hot days, our windy days, our just all weather days. It mm -hmm. was uh, typical Montana weather. Yeah. And then top right here, we got uh, Mr. Ryan Bassham. And uh, if you guys are watching via video, which you should, because we have, we're have, we going to talk about the display of wild creatures. <laughs> it, re it reminds me of the room that Ace Ventura walks in, in the Ace Ventura. When, when you know, <laughs> we're, we're going for that. We're not. I need a bigger room is the problem, because not everything's fitting in here. I think he said it's a lovely room of death. Uh, Correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And then top, <laughs> that's, that's the goal. Top left, we have uh, Bryce Bishop, the founder, the CEO, the master of the universe oh, of no. Peaks Equipment. I don't think those titles are accurate, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gritty, Gritty and uh, Lampers, it's amazing to see both of your faces actually sitting at your houses, I'm assuming. Uh, most of the time when we try to get you guys on a conference call, you're on some cool hunt. Can you explain? Mm. Well, yeah, it's that time of year, I guess, right, Dave? We're, we're trying to get everything ready for the cool hunts that are coming, um, which, and they're coming fast. We got stuff going on in August, but I know Brian's editing all day, every day over there, him and Brad, and we just wrapped up our summit. So we're recovering from that and, and just uh, kind of planning for fall and getting our checklist this done so that we can enjoy the fall season coming but we got a lot of hunts coming up together so brian are you resting up i'm hitting the mountain every day doing a lot of working out exercise fitness stuff uh you know this is the time of year to get everything dialed getting the bow dialed doing a bunch of archery shoots hitting the 3d courses a couple days a week just just uh prep um that's after five o'clock from like 6 a.m. to 5 a.m. 5 p.m. I just work on the computer <laughs> and edit. <laughs> so it's been a it's a it's a crazy time between Ryan's Western Hunting Summit and bear season. Like I feel like I've been gone for two and a half three months. So you have been. Yeah, true. It's yeah. it's <laughs> it's been brutal. Uh, something's got to give. That's a lot to cram <laughs> in. And, uh, I need more. I need more desk time if I'm going to keep up with, you know the uh, workload right you know you can't spend the whole time in the mountains uh there <laughs> actually has to if you do what i do for a living you actually have to uh sit behind a computer for a while you that's, the, the that's the beauty of you and lapper's relationship is that he can just spend all his time in the mountains <laughs> and then you work all the magic in the background and then it all just comes together uh, yeah. what, what are you editing brian are you still editing last year yeah, we uh, we did a great hunt, Ryan and I, with uh, Brady Miller of Go Hunt and Pedro Ampuero from from Spain, our, a bow hunter from Spain. The four of us went out in the spring and hunted bears, had an epic adventure, and so we're editing that, and we're actually pl putting that on the Go Hunt YouTube channel, Go Hunt platform. They're gonna do a three part series. They're gonna launch, and then. Ryan and Kaim, all our friend uh, Kaim is working on stuff with with us, and so we'll have, uh, you know, Lampers has a great hunt that we did. It's all spring bear, basically, all of it that we're working on. And so there's probably there's probably like six episodes, seven episodes, in, you know, at and I think I think we have like five of them done. So we're about ready to launch a whole bunch of them. So July, the latter, latter half of July and August, we should be you know, really pumping out a lot of fresh film content for the public. Will be fun. Do you, do you guys, 
how, how's the feedback on bear content and the current temperature yeah. of the of the world? I mean, I know I know hunters love it because it's kind of at their at, at arm's reach. Just about anybody that lives in a western state has access to go bear hunting, um, and generally mm-hmm. speaking. But like, do you guys get pretty pummeled from the anti hunters and stuff like that on the bear content? You know. <clears throat> I would say we used to, uh, it's been a handful of years though, honestly, a few years ago where you'd still get the occasional, um, you know, snide comment or whatever, just a lot of folks that don't understand it really. But these days, honestly, Dave, I, we don't see it much. We, um, I feel like there's been a switch guys start to, um, maybe watch the videos, understand how we do it. The, I think a lot of the uh, disconnect was they, a lot of the public just thinks that we kill these bears. We're not eating these bears. It has nothing to do with meat. It's a trophy animal, things like that. And, you know, we've done our best to try to um, explain why we're hunting bears. And Brian and I, and I know a handful of, you know, my closest friends, I mean, we do it for a lot of reasons. Um, meat is one of them. We absolutely love, love it. But quite honestly, I think people have taken to that. They've seen um, the respect we give and and how we actually use these animals. And, we just don't see a whole lot. At least I don't personally, um, as far as just people not understanding it anymore. Is that so, Lampers? Okay. Is that is that because you're like just cold as ice and you don't really care what other people think? <laughs> well, there's there's that too. That could be a thing. But. I, honestly, uh, last year Ryan killed a wolf on one of our bear hunts, and if and if you use that sort of as a case study of the public's reaction we hear almost i hear almost nothing regarding bears black bear hunting anymore like it's virtually dead silent like i just don't hear anyone complain about it um i mean it's almost universally positive there's a lot we've been doing it for quite a long time now sharing bear films especially canning bear meat eating bear meat eating it on the mountain so we've really really i think educated the public so have a lot of other people too and so i think at this point there's a wide acceptance of black bear hunting but you throw a wolf on the on the on the uh youtube i get every day i get people um hating on us and calling us killers murderers scumbags losers evil um you know every day there's not a day that goes by that that the wolf film doesn't get, um, a, you know, four or five hateful comments. And what's interesting about that is that video just gets more and more views all the time. Well, these are people who have nothing to do with hunting. Most of these people who view it, this shouldn't really show up in their feed. This isn't for them. Mm-hmm. But the YouTube algorithm knows that this negative content gets people to watch gets people to hate gets people to they they know it's just fodder for it's red meat for the haters and they they pump it out there and it just goes through you can look at my metrics on this video i don't know it's maybe at a million views right now when most of our videos get around 150 to 200 thousand views um and over the course of the year, they might pick up somewhere around two or 300,000, but this video is a million. Obviously it's, it's a different animal and a large number of those views are YouTube just plugging it into their algorithm to promote it to two people who will have a reaction to it. Uh, they don't care if it's positive or negative. Uh, they just, I think it just, they just want to see something happen. Now they can't do that with the bear footage. It doesn't get the reaction. People aren't doing that, but I throw up a grizzly bear film Mm. and there's a twinge of it, a tiny twinge of it. Not very much though. Um, But, but bear, it's pretty much, it feels very accepted at this point. Um, And, and the culture around it has, has changed. I mean, I remember in 2007 when I posted some film and some video and shared pictures on Facebook and stuff sometime 2010 the the heat i got was similar to this wolf hunt Hmm. and um i don't get that anymore bass ham you just got back from africa and i've seen several pictures and videos floating around of hippos dead yeah uh i have to imagine that 
there's some hate that comes along with that. And by the way, I, sure. I, I would love to, and I'm sure the room would love to know more about hippo. Like I've never thought of hunting a hippo. I, I have no, <laughs> I have no opinion on it really, but I'm, a, sure. I'm <clears throat> sure it's like one of those things that I just don't understand. So maybe you can yep. shed a bit of, cause I think it, I think it kind of, it's kind of similar, right? It's a controversial, a lot of it's a controversial animal that I assume sure. in its own, uh, geography needs to be managed in some way, but I have no idea. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, <clears throat> obviously I, you know, Ryan and Lambers are do much more Western big game hunting, which I, I do as well, but, um, I, I love the international stuff too. So yeah, Kaim and I just got done with a hunt in Zambia on the Luangwa river and the Luangwa river has the highest density of, of hippos, um, more than anywhere else on the continent of Africa. And so what most people don't realize is that, you know, you have your, your big five, but the most dangerous animal in regards to um, human animal conflict is the hippo. They kill more humans um, than any other animal on the continent on an, on an annual basis. And so outside of just that component, um, the human wildlife uh, conflict component, there's also in these large densities of areas. And we're going to put a film out on this that we just got done doing while we were there. Um, you know, because of the way the ecosystem works there, they can actually produce anthrax and kill an entire um, system within those rivers, sections of rivers where they're at that, that water that affects local villages, et cetera. And so the numbers do need to be managed for those reasons. Additionally, um, I think there's a large misconception around poaching in Africa. Most people think it's for elephant ivory and rhino horns. And actually, um, it's the, uh, the illegal meat trade uh, issues that are, are the biggest issue around poaching there. And so you have these local chiefdoms with different villages in them close to these wildlife management areas where they're trying to practice conservation. And these guys come in and they just kill with reckless abandon. And when they're setting these wire snares anything can get caught in there, but they're doing it for meat. Um, and so the problem is there's no regulation. So when we go and we hunt a hippo to bring this full circle, um, we're, we're doing a number of things. Um, we're helping control and manage the populations there. We're also taking that meat, that animal is about 5,000, 6,000 pounds. The hippo that, that I was able to go and hunt fed a village of 200 people for three weeks. So that's pretty meaningful. I think um, the, the financial implications from that, a lot of that money goes to actually hiring ex-poachers that we've been able to find and try to get on the right path. And we bring them in as trackers um, and, and give them a job so they don't have to go and poach anymore. And so it's it's a full circle process. It's really misunderstood. Um, but a How lot of similarities. Okay, so hold on. Hold on. I have a question. How in the hell do you get a 6,000 pound hippo out of a river? <laughs> Brother. I mean, that's all interesting, but that's what I want to, I want, I got to know this. <laughs> so I'm um, super excited for Kyle to get this edit done because we show the whole process. It is unreal. So it is, there's no packing this one out on your back boys. We'll just say that. <clears throat> um, basically if you get one down in the, in the water, it takes about two hours for them to fill with the air. They flow back up to the top. Long story short, um, whoever draws short straw goes out in a canoe because you don't want to be in hippo and croc infested waters. Um, tie a rope around it. And then we get our best, do our best to get it back to shore. It took about 12, 15 of us to basically imagine tug of war. When you're a kid, there was like 12, 15 of us on one side of the rope and the hippo was doing nothing on the other end. And he just kind of strong armed that sucker back in. It took about two hours for eight guys to break that thing down. We got a cool time lapse of it. It's like this massive 5,000 pound critter. And then in about two hours, everything's gone. I mean, everything gets used. Nothing goes to waste. All of it. We had hippo tongue. We ate hippo nuggets in camp. We had hippo jerky. We we ate everything while we were in camp. Hmm. It was cool. Was is the meat? How's the meat? Chewy. Chewy. How's well, is that how they? <laughs> Go is ahead, that bro. how they just how they cooked it though? Yeah, we didn't have a whole lot of time. Um, the the biltong or jerky was was really good. Um, you know, we we did our best to try to prepare it the, the best you could in a tent camp on the side of a river, uh, but we didn't have all the amenities that you would have to really do it right. But it was it was still pretty darn tasty. So does that? Yeah, I was gonna say flavor is it pretty good and and is it fatty? 
Um, it actually wasn't that fatty, which is interesting because when you cut into those things, you've got like three layers. It's, their skin is super thick. And then you got like two layers of fat. Then you get down to the meat. Um, but it, it didn't it didn't taste super gamey. I mean, um, it tasted like some of the other planes game there. I mean, I've had mule deer that are way gamier than oh some of the don't, over don't there. you dare bash mule deer with <laughs> Brian lampers on the podcast I'm not bashing mule deer i'm just saying i'm My giving word. a I, I like mule deer i'm what, just saying is what you're saying is is ryan bassham says that hippo tastes better than mule deer that's what i heard that's what i heard too <laughs> i mean uh, i mean you boys need to go to africa and start eating some of their game that's not too bad i will say the best you know the best things we ate there and I mean, hand, Ed Brinker, this may be fighting words with you. Better than Axis deer, Puku and Roan. I, I, I have Telling no you. defense because I don't even know what those it's animals fan- are. That's right. It's never fantastic. Heard of fantastic. It's good stuff, man. I don't so, travel more than six hours away from my home. On an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, but so bringing it back, back, back to, to where we were at with this. Like, I, I've seen a huge change in this, and I do a lot of work with um, Safari Club International, SCI. Um, I think that. To, to Brian's point, we've seen less issues with the anti the the anti hunters like bashing and attacking hunters online. But I think what makes me most fearful, based on what I see from guys like Ben Cassidy, who's up on Capitol Hill fighting for hunters' rights, and you know he has his ear to the ground. Like every time there's a bill that could be detrimental to hunting and what we all get to enjoy and do, um, he relays that back to a small group of us. And it, guys, it's scary. Like. Um, we may not be getting attacked personally on our own social media accounts anymore, but what these groups are doing and organizing to get bills passed through legislation, it may not affect what we're doing right now, but the ripple effect that it could come back and, and, and haunt us later. It's scary. Um, it's, it's something to get involved in and definitely get in front of if we can. Yeah. It seems like the wolf thing, like seven, eight, ten years ago, it was much hotter topic than it is right now. I mean, I know it's sure. still yeah, obviously yeah. Brian, like you said, sure. it's still a hot topic. There's no doubt about it. But I, for example, uh, I got it. I get this is a comment from yesterday. Uh, this oh, guy we're doing says, hate tweets. I love it. Let's do. Yeah, this, this guy says uh, <laughs> mean <saying>, tweets. <laughs> this one's not too bad, actually. Um, and you know, we we as as individuals who care about hunting in the outdoors. We have to decide as we share content and get comments, do we respond? Do we ignore? Do we delete? Do we, do, is it just noise? And I feel like I have a responsibility to have a discussion. If someone says something, yes, 100%. I, I hate it. Uh, it takes up time in my day, but here's an example of what happened yesterday. A, a guy got on the YouTube video and he said, all for hunting herbivores, but sad to see intelligent apex predators like this in their prime get taken out. Majestic as F, not sure what the allure of killing them is. Hmm. So then I wrote back to him and I said, they don't look so majestic when they rip a baby calf out of its mother during birth or when a pack of wolves move into an area and decimate the moose and elk herds. Wolves are incredible animals, but I don't give them special privileges. They aren't more important to me than the rest of the animals in nature. And we don't hunt wolves recklessly. We hunt wolves as part of an overall game management plan that balances the well-being of all the animals in an ecosystem. This wolf was legally harvested and killed based on sound biological and ecological studies. Sound wildlife management starts to fall apart when animals and animals suffer when emotions get in the way of logic. And then he wrote back and said, I stand corrected. You're I, I appreciate what you said. I understand now. And you're right. I was definitely emotional about this. I'm going to look at wolf hunting in a totally different way now. And it was yeah. like, oh, wow. That was. That's what know. I find with all these hot topic issues, whether it's gun control or mm-hmm. wolves or abortion or whatever the hot topic issue is. We as humans, when emotions take over, it's hard to have a rational conversation. I mean, I agree. I look, my favorite movie is Dances with Wolves. All right. Like, I, I think wolves are majestic. I, 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 I love them, but I also understand because I'm deeply integrated into the industry uh, why we need to manage them, why, why it's important, and what they actually do. But I don't think anybody's saying that 
uh, wolves aren't pretty or cool. I mean, we're all predators too. We actually respect wolves, just like mountain lions, right? Everybody or a lot of hunters want to take a mountain lion, but we all respect the hell out of it. Actually, we're jealous of them because they're way better hunters than we are, right? Yeah, I would tell well, people, some people I say, you know, look, you know, I live the wild. I'm a student of the outdoors. I'm a student of nature. This is my life. I, I'm deeply involved in it and I care deeply about it. And when someone comes from some, some high rise building in the city and is lecturing me on the wild, I have a, I have a hard time. One of my reactions is double barrel middle finger and tell them to go screw themselves. You know, that's, I mean, oh, I know it sounds crazy. I'm not like that generally. Like I'm very kind and, and patient. Lamp Lampers, but... <laughs> can you sign off on that? Is he generally very kind? <laughs> Uh, I see it every once in a while, but I don't know about that. <laughs> like, no, seriously, sometimes, like, uh, my, my, what I want to type is totally different, and yeah. I have to exercise a lot of restraint to simply say things in a very polite and, you know, I still am a bit forceful, but I'm, I'm, uh, I try not to call names, and I try not to insult. I just try to keep it to the facts and move on, and I found that you know, this guy, here he is with this opinion, and now he's completely kind of looking at it from a different different viewpoint. And from now on, he's going to have a different idea on how he's going to – that one time, that one guy responded to me in this video about this thing. And I think it really – it's it's that's how you have these discussions and you change people's minds. It's just one person at a time like this. Um, I, I agree, well, I, I, think think, I think this is really important. Go ahead, Bryce. I was just going to say the same thing. That's that's the importance of the platform that you have, right? And and Bass MU as well is is we need that voice on the other side that is correcting this you know narrative that's being perpetuated out there about how we're just slaughtering these predator animals or or we're killing these poor innocent hippos and nobody really understands the reality, and so we need the voices of you and pass them and the and the important work that you're doing to educate the public on the reality of, of what's really happening out there so I think, it's not yeah no i i bryce I, I mean you're spot on i think the best thing people can take away from listening and watching this discussion like everybody can do this like everybody can i think the if i go back seven years ago <clears throat> when i first got my first death threat because of hunting i'll never forget that my wife was freaked out um like the way I handled things back then was horrible. Like I was ready to go, like, let's fight. Um, but you know, Brian, to your point, like, man, like if you can immediately take the emotion out of it and if everybody can do this on a more consistent basis, whether it's directed to you or not and be like, Hey, I would really like the opportunity to have a logical discussion with you. Fact base. I would love to hear your side would love the opportunity to explain my side. Like every time I've met those situations like that um, on social media, and we've been able to have a more logical conversation if they opt into it. Sometimes they don't, obviously. Um, it, it ends in a positive way, like Brian just shared. And I think as outdoorsmen, it's it's our obligation to, to do that um, as much as we can. I, I believe that social media, uh, Jordan Peterson came out with a podcast yesterday on Twitter and its psychological impact on humanity and discourse and communication. Um, I think that there's something wrong severely wrong with uh how social media impacts how this global communication process impacts humanity and we're not quite sure how to respond how to we're not handling it well because if you were on an airplane bass ham and somebody said this to me about wolves you know i don't understand it he would say it in a more polite way he'd mm -hmm. get his point across but he'd do so with some degree of face to face with some degree of tact. And then I would respond, giving him the benefit of the doubt and saying, I, I totally hear where, what you're saying. I, and I understand where you're coming from. Cause I think wolves are amazing animals as well. And especially for dog lovers. I mean, you can't, you can't look at a wolf and not associate it with maybe your favorite, you know, companion that's four legged in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. I get that. And I would respond with, um, patient and tact and we would have a discussion and we would respect each other on social media there's that doesn't happen it goes straight to um it goes straight to 
just sniping each other with name calling and, and horrible comments. Cause there is no, you don't actually see the person necessarily face to face. You, you see this person is someone's son who, who, yeah. who is also <laughs> someone's father and, and you see a human. Right. And it's There's so no voice just, inflection. There's none of that. They, it's yeah, just easy. Like you said, just to bash. The first step for me is to go, okay, um, well, I read it and my first instinct is, you know, to crap all over them. <laughs> and, then, and I stop and go, look, let's give this person the benefit of the doubt. You know, let's ignore their emotional comment or, or whatever. And let's just, let's just get into this and give them all the benefit of the doubt. I try to picture them as somebody that is like my sister's best friend. And, and then I start responding because I'm going to treat them, but I have to go through this mental exercise. I have to actually read their comment and then think of them as my sister's best friend. Then I can respond with some level of dignity or, or respect for the person. My initial response is my, my gut. It outdoor class is the new source of premium outdoor education from trusted and knowledgeable experts. For hunters committed to improving their skills, Outdoor Class is the only subscription-based e-learning platform that provides unlimited access to video lessons from the world's most respected experts. Learn from industry leaders like Corey Jacobson, Randy Newberg, Remy Warren, and other experts across all the topics that affect you as a hunter. Make sure to follow Outdoor Class Official on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and take your game to the next level by going to OutdoorClass.com. You can use code ALTITUDE at checkout for 20% off. That is ALTITUDE at checkout for 20% off at OutdoorClass.com. It immediately is to do something else. I've learned not to comment right away, too. Like, I read it, and I come back, and I respond tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And there might be, there's a lot of people out there that they're not, they're not even worth your time. Right. There's they're 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 very unhappy and bitter and they're they're but David, that's that's the part that worries me is that we just quit because look, I I, I've done this where my I want to just delete every comment I disagree with and live my life. Uh you just don't get it and not even respond, remove call. But man, I feel like that is such a cop out. It is, it is my duty, my job. So I give these people the benefit of the doubt. I have a rule. I respond one time, generally try to be diplomatic and, and state my thing. If they respond with more of the same old, then I delete it. But I give everybody, generally, I give everybody one option, one, one opportunity. Now, if it's, if it's way over the top, I just delete it. Cause there's, that's just a crazy person. Well, here, here's, here's what I've gotten in the habit of doing. And there's a reason. So like, I, I refuse to, to delete most of them. Um, and I haven't gotten any in a while. I think it's good to leave it all up there because you don't know who else is watching and reading that. And I think that you might be influencing somebody that's not even part of the conversation, but they're reading it and they're seeing this logical person have a, a very controlled response, trying to, to be kind. And then you have this psycho that's just like wanting to question your, the size of your manhood and call you names. Who do you think people are going to, to side with? I mean, I think a normal human is going to side with whoever is being polite, logical, and trying to be fact-based. And so I think leaving it up there for people to see is a positive. And I've had people come back after reading some of those and in a DM or in person when I've met them, They've, they've mentioned that and they're like, man, that, I, I learned a lot from how that situation was handled. So I think leave it up there. I have, I have strong, uh, uh, shocker. I have strong opinions on this subject, <laughs> <laughs> like every subject. Uh, Why so, am I not surprised? <laughs> yeah. So it, here's my take on that Bass Ham, because I do believe that you're right. If I, if there's a, an intelligent response, you don't want to delete that back and forth but then there are other comments. And, and for the most part, I, I do think that we have a, a very um, mob mentality group of people out there. Yeah. They're looking for a mob. So they come onto the page, they see the wolf and they go, 
oh, this is wrong. They haven't even watched the film. They just see Ryan there with this majestic wolf, and it's majestic. Like, I think he killed the biggest wolf in Idaho that's older than dirt, white. Like, you couldn't get a more... It's a Lampers wolf. ...sexy-looking wolf. It's on, kind of annoying to see Ryan <laughs> with such a majestic wolf. Um, but anyway, there's no jealousy here at all. But anyway, this wolf, you see it, right? The, some dude comes across it. He sees it has emotional reaction. He goes to the comment section. He starts scrolling through and what he's looking for are people who agree with him. How many people can I find that also find this absolutely disgusting and hateful? And when they scroll through that and they see nothing but positive comments, mostly. And then when they do see a comment, that uh, they agreed with and my reply. And then the person sides with me over and over. It's like, wait a minute, I'm not the majority here, but wait a minute, maybe there's something wrong with my way of thinking. If I just allow like all this hateful stuff to reside there, these people feed on that crap. These people lap it up. They're looking for it when they get there and they find out that there's nothing there for them, or there's very few people that agree with their psychosis. They start to question. I think they start to question whether to leave a comment at all, but also like their point of view. So for me, it's like when people come on there, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to remove some of that stuff because I don't think that it's healthy for the culture. I don't think it's healthy for, for people with that tendency. And we have a, we have a, 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 a culture right now who is, who, who just looks for that, wants to find all these people. And then they jump in on the fray. They just smell blood in the water. They just jump in to jump in. And when I delete that stuff, the, the number of people that jump in the water is so much less. If I let it there, it breeds itself. It just, it just grows and grows and grows. So for me, I've learned like some things, if it's a cordial conversation and we disagree, I leave it there. If it's just psycho, if it's just yeah. rude, if it's just, just totally negative, I delete it. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to uh, spur on any of the mob to jump in. Yeah. It's interesting because we're talking a lot about like negative comments around hunting, but I think also, especially guys like Lampers specifically, who kind of came out of nowhere to a lot of people, you know, five, six years ago, and then all of a sudden, like, you're a very successful person, but also, and especially a very successful hunter. And that makes a lot of people feel insecure about their own success. Therefore, they want to throw hate, not around the hunting, but they're like, yeah, well, he can do that because A, A B, C, or I could do that you know, it must be nice or, you know, all that type of crap. Lampers, have you seen that? I mean, again, you're cold as ice. You probably don't even read comments. Um, but have you, have you seen much of that? Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of that. I think that just goes with everything. Um, the must be nice thing is, uh, and Cameron's done a great job of exposing that. It's, I think when people read into it a little bit and they see that it, it is on them, um, when they're, you know, they're not able to maybe do um, some of the things that Brian and I are able to do. I, I like to point out, and, and I'm a guy that I, I erase some of those comments, and then I will have good conversations with, with others if, it's, if it makes sense. But I do like to dive into those DMs, and I will have more conversations aside from the limelight. And it seems as if those conversations go a little better. They have for me, um, because then it just doesn't become a, you know, a rock throwing contest and trying to get the last snide remark in. And, and I've made great friends uh, getting into those DMS and actually like explaining myself better. I've gone as far as to um, actually leave my number and have them call me. Uh, I'm not that great at typing anyway. I'd rather have a conversation. <laughs> so, so I will have a phone call with someone to explain my position. And I've done that probably too many times. My number's floating around out there a lot, I would imagine. Uh, but those conversations generally go pretty well in the end. And I've been able to explain myself, share my opinion. I think with the jealousy thing, you know, what I like to remind a lot of folks, and Brian's done the same. I've heard him talk about it 
you know, a lot of this jealousy comes from very young gentlemen in this, um, in this community that are just getting into it. And you got to remind them like, look, I'm, I'm 48 years old. Brian and I are old as dirt. You know, we, I agree we, with that. You guys are old. We, guys are old. <laughs> we, are old. <laughs> we, we have, and we, I feel like we've earned the ability. Uh, we've worked hard our entire lives. Um, we've done jobs that, you know, we didn't want to do. And, and we've gotten to a place where we're now able to do this thing that we really like to do. And that's hunting. It did. I wasn't able to do this when I was 18 or 20. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a career yet. I didn't, I didn't uh, have my life set out. So now, you know, I'm 48 and it's been a long time in the making for us to be able to have the time to dedicate to this thing that we love to do. And we've just happened to find ourselves in a position to be able to do it. And we try to do it respectfully and to the best of our abilities. But, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, a 20 something year old kid he just qu doesn't quite think about it in those terms. And he does have that must be nice to be able to. Well, it is. And I hope I hope they get there as well. But it's it's usually doesn't come in your 20s. Well, and let's be honest, it, you might they might get to be 48 and still not be as, as successful as you. Sure. And that's OK. I think I think people create these. I'm, I'm all about like dreaming big and all these things, but you, you have to, uh, like set your own goals and have your own parameters. And, you know, I, I don't think it's very productive as a 20 year old that hasn't even started in the workforce yet to be throwing stones at a 48 year old who spent 20 years in the workforce and has set up there in your podcast that we did Lampers. You talked about this. You said, yeah. if you want to do what I do, you have to set up your life to do what I do. It's not like you can just turn on a light switch um, and spend three weeks trying to kill the same elk. Um, right. You have to spend years. And that's what people, the, it's always the work that people want to skip. It's like, especially this younger generation, I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of it. I hear like, and I'm not, I, I, I hate being one of these guys that, you know, back in the day when I was a kid, we didn't get to do that. That's not like that. But it is true that there is a lack of work ethic floating around out in the world, not everywhere, but people always want to skip to the end. And it's like, no, you, I mean, you might be able to do that in some certain cases, but most of us. Probably more so now than ever, right? Just because of the education that's out there. Um, yeah, but, yeah you know, for there's sure. There's podcasts, there's great information, but we talk about it all the time. And we talked about it in your podcast prior, Dave. And that was uh, experience. You know, you have to make the mistakes. You kind of have to have those, those growing pains and learn a bit on your own in the field. You know, you, you can hear, you know, uh, very successful people talk about it a lot. And you can gain a lot from that and cut the learning curve incredibly well, but you still got to get out there and do it. And, uh, and you got to set your life up to where you have the time, which is one of the most important pieces to, uh, be able to, you know, spend time in the field and get these things figured out. And, uh, you're going to make mistakes. We all do. And nobody, nobody is out there, um, you know, filling tags year after year after year that didn't go through the work in the, in the beginning. I think, you know, Lambers, you said something just a second ago that really kind of resonated with me. And it was, you know, you talked about the dedication to this lifestyle and creating the time. But I, I think that that's one thing that the younger generation really hasn't understood yet is that if you want something, you've got to dedicate your life to going after it. And once you do that, and you become the very best at whatever it is you choose to do, the success will come later. But more importantly, the money side of it kind of takes care of itself at that point. Like you don't have to go chase the money anymore. I always tell my kids, like, I don't, I don't care what you become in life, just become the very best at it that you can. And the money will take care of itself. And if you love what you do and you're dedicated to it, and you're the top dog in whatever field that is, the money side of it will, won't be an issue for you anymore. But you're going to have to go through that process of you know, committing yourself, of grinding it out year after year, going through the heartaches and the pain to get there. And I think too many 20-something-year-olds at this point, like Dave said, just want to skip those steps. Well, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, yeah. the, it's the ugly work. 
It's the work. It's skipping the work yeah. because we, everything is immediate gratification. We're all like just culturally, we're all seeking that like that immediate high. And uh, I, I get it. We're all guilty of it. I mean, I think what they don't understand, though, is that if you love what you're doing, there's satisfaction that comes in the work part of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you go out and you put the work in and then you look back and you go, wow. I just did a really hard thing and I, and I overcame these trials or these struggles or whatever. And there's such satisfaction in that. And they, there's this disconnect, I think with this younger generation that they don't understand that work equals satisfaction. They think work is like this really negative thing that just like is something to avoid at all costs. So I've interviewed, um, I don't know, a half dozen people in the last three months to be my assistant. And one of the like the common answer that I get when I ask them all the question, where do you see yourself five years from now, ten years from now? And I'm I'm generalizing on purpose, but basically what they tell me is is they don't want it, they don't want to have to work and they just want all the money to go do whatever they want. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and and wow. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I mean, hey. gosh. I mean, shoot for the stars, hey. but you know, I think you're, sk I think you're skipping about 20 years in there. What a lot of people don't realize, like spe specifically when, because let's be honest, to set your life up like you guys have, and even Bassham, and even myself, uh, there is the the there's like the financial part. There's setting your family structure up. There's setting support systems. Like, there's a lot of work that goes into being able to do the things that we all get to do. Um, and all of that takes uh, resources, right? Money, time. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. And I just think, again, that whole step, that whole 20-year or 15-year step, which is a lot of work, gets skipped. It's like, well, dude, you're skipping a pretty big step there. I had a, I had a, a, a gentleman come into my office and he was looking around at my walls and I got posters from my days at Sitka gear and, you know, an animal here or there. And like, you know, it, it's a cool little space that I, I created here that I work in every day. And it's got a lot of memories in it. And I go, what do you want to do with your life? Like, where do you see yourself? He's like, I want to do what you do. And he's like 19. And I'm like, great. Uh, I'm 41. Uh, and I started out as a dang near high school flunk out, uh, uh intern making $10 an hour. And I worked for 15 years or 20 years to get to where I am. And, uh, he's, and you can see in his mind go, Oh, I want to do that right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Rieger, I think that's, I think it's funny because almost on a weekly basis, I still get high school kids and college kids reach out and they're like, man, how do I get into the hunting industry? How do I get to, to do what you do? And I'm like, man, the path is different from everybody. And there is no quick path, man. Like it's a 15, 20 year grind for sure. Like, and the people that try to skip those steps, they crash and burn and they're, they're done before they ever get started. I don't think it's much difference Nat, you know, Nashville is called a 10 year town. If you're like an mm. aspiring country musician, like, that. like, and you're going to move to Nashville and dedicate your entire life to being a country superstar. The rule is, is like, you got to put in your decade. Um, yeah. and, and some people don't have to, you know, like you might win American Idol or something. But for the most part, a lot of people are living out of their cars for 10 years, 10 years. Like most people get tired of grinding for like a week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> here's, what's, here's what's crazy. So like some of those music and I'm not a big music guy. Don't don't be mad at me, Brinker. I'm sorry. I'm I appreciate mad. music. I appreciate music. I do just not to the level you do, but some of these documentaries out there, I just watched, I, I didn't even know who machine gun Kelly was and I could care less about what Taylor Swift is doing. But when you watch those documentaries, their work ethic is insane. It's on a level that if, if I could do half of what they do, as far as work ethic, I would get way more done. It's unreal. Yeah. Super I mean, it's, impressive it's, stuff. It's, it's, it's no different than spending a month on the mountain you know, or yeah. it's, it's all very similar. And I don't know if it's the, uh, Malcolm Galdwell, Gladwell, uh, 10,000 hours thing or whatever it is, but there is definitely this whole step that gets skipped. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that now, I, I'm kind of a, uh, you know, I like doing multiple things at once and I know that I'm never going to be the best at any one of those things, but I can be pretty good at all of them. Um, everybody has a different goal, but if you want to be the best, the best, the best, the best, the best, that's like 
total dedication, work ethic. At, like it's like Cameron Haynes level work ethic every day. No, and it, at nauseum. When you look at anyone that's successful in any area of life, you know, um, I always go. You know, people can say, "Oh, he's just talented," or this, or he got everything given to him. I never do that. I. I never take someone's position in, in their success for granted. Obviously they got there for some reason or another. Um, and I, I think, you know, I say this all the time to people. I started gritty, the gritty Bowman when I was like 40 um, and uh, 39, 40 years old. And I say to people all the time, you know, 40 year old Brian succeeded where 30 year old Brian would have failed. If I tried to do what I did at age 40 when I was 30, it would have failed. I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have pulled it off. There was a lot of things in between the age of, you know, 20 and 40 that happened that made it possible for me to succeed when I started the Gritty Bowman venture at age 40. And it just, it's just, that's just life. Um, I never planned on this happening either. It just sort of started to happen for me just it just things fell into place and then but the one thing that i did have from day one was a work ethic i was gonna do it i was gonna pay the price and so people come to me all the time especially young guys that are trying to film and produce film they come to me and they say you know i want to learn i'll i'll share my ideas my thoughts i'll show them some things but then it goes back to what you said a minute ago david 10,000 hours, you know, I spent 10,000 hours behind the computer over the years making film. You add up the hours and the years. It's like, I've been doing this a while now. I kind of just seems like it was just yesterday. But when I add it up, I'm like, I'm at that 10,000 hour mark. Nobody can just come along and in a thousand hours be where I, where I'm at at 10. It just, there's a few people that are gifted, but for the most part, um, the hours are required. The sacrifice is required. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think we live in, most people just don't want to do that. I don't think it's necessarily, I think this generation is definitely decadent. They have a lot given to them. Life's too easy. There's not enough struggle just naturally. But I also I almost think, think it's is, human nature too. Isn't it a little that's bit? That's what because I was going to say. I remember when I was in my teens, I was immature. I hated I was really into sports back then. Like I hated the Yankees with a passion. Why? <laughs> because they were so dang good. Like there was years, you know, you, you hate Tom Brady. Why? Because he's that good. And it took me a while to figure out, like you, you got to respect what they've put themselves through and all the hours um, to get to that point. I love the heck out of Tom Brady, right? You know, since I've matured guys like him, um, <laughs> I hated yeah. Jordan. I was a Drexler, Portland fan, Blazers, <laughs> yeah. and that son of a. He just, he just kicked it. Oh, man, I hated Jordan. And then <laughs> now I look back and I'm like, I loved and hated him, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But now I just, I just love, love hey, the guy. Bryce, Inspired. do you experience any of this stuff being the new brand in the hunting space? Uh, you know, there's obviously we know what you're doing, like meaning this, this room and, a, and you know, the brand's growing, but you're still a fairly young brand. Most people would go, dude, come on, man. Like you can't, you're going to compete with, you know, all the other brands out there. And you're like, yeah, just give me five or 10 years and you'll realize that that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, I think so. But I don't know. I just, I, I don't know if it's thick skin. I don't know what it is, Dave. I, I, I have a, really good ability i think maybe because i'm so non-emotional to just let that stuff bounce off me i i just don't get worked up about that um i think i am much more focused on what the objective is and what we're trying to accomplish here and what the end goal is supposed to be and so bryce you should have been a poker player because you really <laughs> yes 100 <laughs> percent. you really don't get mad or sad or anything it's like dude show me something man like am i i, know. I almost kind of, <laughs> i almost kind of want to try to piss you off just to see if you can actually you know i tried to <laughs> i tried to kill him in a side by side <laughs> barely got her eyes out of him. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that's probably one of the times I've laughed the hardest in my life because 
<laughs> but, All right, well, we, need, had... we need a story. Well, let's hear it because I didn't know I, this. Uh, well, I can't do it justice, so Gritty's got to tell the story. Well, it all starts I... from the film night that we were supposed to have, right? <laughs> At the all Western right. Summit on the mountain. Go for it, Brian. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we were at the Western Hunting Summit, and the one thing Ryan asked me to do, the one thing <laughs> is show a movie on on, uh, on 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 the mountain <laughs> that night. And I managed to screw the one thing up because I forgot the adapter for the HDMI. Now, hold on, Brian. On I have to stop screen. you right here just for a second, because the weekend before that, when I was there, you also failed at a job leading somebody up the mountain. So, I, you know, this whoa, is becoming... Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that was a collective failure. I, uh... I, I had no idea that I was in charge of that group of people. <laughs> well, I just remember, and, frankly, I remember strolling into camp and all of a sudden people are like there's people missing and the first people that lampers looks at is me and brian yep. and i'm like wait a minute I, I i'm in charge of these people look, look the truth is this is what ryan does to people everyone he throws them in the deep part of the pool and then is like swim figure it out uh, if you become his hunting partner you better He'll leave you. He will just leave you. He will just go off and leave you. <laughs> and like Kayam told me yesterday, he was working on some film and he's like, Brian, like I just had to keep up because if I lost sight of Ryan, I had no idea where I was or how I was going to get my way out. Like I just, he's like, I just turned up the burnt afterburners and, and I just kept on going. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's good for, that's good for Kayam. Kayam uh, Kay, uh, needs that. Yeah, Kayam's a young a, a young content producer that we're all kind of working with. It. For those that are listening and wondering who Kayam is, good dude, but he's like just drinking through a fire hose, like going yeah. on some of his first backcountry hunts, going to hunt hippos in Zambia. Uh, and if he doesn't keep up with Ryan, a, he will just be. He didn't. He didn't have a digital map. Right. He didn't have a compass. He did. He showed up with a video camera. So. <laughs> <laughs> like and then Ryan, Ryan, Ryan will leave your ass behind. He will just 100%. leave it, and so uh, he figured that out and just uh, it pushed him, pushed him harder. But anyway, I was in charge of the film, and uh, lost it. Didn't bring the adapter, but Bryce had one in, down at the camp. We jumped in the side by side. It was just a casual cruise down the mountain oh to get God. the uh, <laughs> to get the cord and we drove back up and that was pretty much it so i don't know what everyone's freaking out about but uh but i did i did have a fun time with bryce uh did you guys drive did you drive a little too fast brian i got a flat tire um Bryce, he's not he's not doing it justice. You were in the car. How he, fast? No, was I mean, he, okay. Bryce, tell it, man. All right. Tell it, so, Bryce. How deep into a story was he when he was driving? He was like no. Lloyd Christmas and Dumb and Dumber in the limo talking about how it's safer to fly than drive to the airport. <laughs> if you're watching this, if you're watching this, you just saw that uh, Brian took a good shot of uh, Blaze right there. And he was probably hyped up on like four of those things because Look. as fast as we were driving down this old logging road on this ranch that we should have been going maybe 15 miles an hour. We were probably going 50 <laughs> with, with eighties rock music, just loud as can be. And we had bright. ACDC. <laughs> we had a little Skinner going. It was back in black. Um, you know, shook me all night long like i mean there was some really it. i mean look i just think bryce needs to unwind a little bit he's a little stuffy and i, I agree brian i'm glad you this was him up a little bit this was like a every day occurrence for me but for bryce it was an adventure so <laughs> it was, it was an, well I, I think that that trip round trip should have taken us how long lampers probably like at least an hour and a half or something right yeah, an hour probably, I would say. I think we did it down and back in what, Brian, like 25 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even with the flat tire. <laughs> even with <laughs> the flat tire. So, <laughs> okay, so so here's what happened. We're we're burning down the mountain, right? Like he's drifting around corners. <laughs> we're we're jumping off of these little rollers. I mean, I'm like hanging on for dear life in this little side by side. 
we get down there. I get in my truck. We find the court. I'm like, score. We get back in. Well, now Brian thinks we're going uphill, so he doesn't have to use brakes. <laughs> he can go twice as fast. <laughs> so we are burning up this mountain, and we have to be going like 45. Well, those side by sides don't quite fit into the you know the the two track of the truck. So we're off the edge a little bit. And we are just burning through this waist high grass. Brian can't see what he's doing whatsoever. Whack. We hit this rock. It sounded like the front axle broke <laughs> off of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Brian slams on the brakes. I get out. He's like, is there, well, first of all, my face, I'm like, what did you just do? <laughs> so we get out. His first question is, is there any damage? I'm like, is there any damage? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I can't I see said, it. I said, do you hear any air coming out of the tire? And he's like, oh, there's air coming out. I'm like, get in, get in. <laughs> we got to go even faster before the air runs out. So Brian gets it, back in and we hauled ass up the mountain. Uh, did, did you make movie night? I did with time to spare. Well, Lampers, Lampers, what would you grade him on from an A to an F on, on his performance in movie night? Well, I mean, honestly, it, it actually, it, how it worked was way better. Like we were actually going to start that movie night a little bit too early because Bryce had come up with this very cool projection screen and it was a little late in the day to, to be putting on this film. But yeah, within 25 minutes, Brian gets back on the, on the top there where we were doing it and the light is starting to fade and he, and he got the show going and it was a, it was a stellar little movie night we had on the mountain. I mean, I had to save Brian's movie night twice. Yeah. I had to, you know, the first, the first week he tried to do it on this little like 40 inch TV for everybody. And I was like, (laughs) dude, that is not doing this thing justice. So I had to go (laughs) round up a projector, bring it up on the mountain. My job was to bring the movie. That was (laughs) my job. (laughs) I just think I'm always making you look good, Brian. Yeah. It was fun. It was, it's, it's just. It's just a lot of fun. Bryce was laughing so hard, and oh I couldn't gosh, quite I was... understand why. But um, I, like I said, this was a little bit. Uh, I suppose. Um, I don't know. I am. I don't take things too seriously in general, especially if we're up on the mountain. Um, I like to have fun. I like to make fun. I like to joke, and uh, I. I just be myself and um, I'm not as concerned about the consequences. One of these days, yeah, I'm going to break something. I'm probably going to fall into a river. I won't die, but I'll get hurt. And then Ryan will gloat. Yes. Yes. The camera always comes out when Brian's crossing a river. Cause I know <laughs> he's, he's been very lucky up until this point. Like somehow he manages to uh, scale these, these scenarios where there's like a, a, a skinny slippery log uh elevated over a fast raging creek and uh somehow some way he makes it across but one of these times i'm gonna get him i like risk taking i like i enjoy climbing rock climbing getting you know when i was younger i did a lot of like type scary stuff a lot of cliff walls i would climb and you know uh, swim across lakes and just to see if i could you know, things like that. And, uh, and anytime we got to like walk across a log and there's a chance that you could fall in and really, there needs to be an element of risk die. and danger. Yeah, die. <laughs> <laughs> That's now, amazing an adventure. Where I draw the line, New Zealand was a whole different animal. That was that, that. The Altitude Show is brought to you by Peaks Equipment, the world's leading technical hard goods and accessories brand for backcountry enthusiasts. From trekking poles to headlamps to best-in-class gators, Peaks delivers a system of products that work to achieve optimal performance in the harshest conditions. Don't suffer on your hunting adventures. Peaks enables you to thrive on the mountain when everyone else is going home. Visit peaksequipment.com and use code ALTITUDE for 10% off today. That's ALTITUDE for 10% off on peaksequipment.com. That went beyond risk-taking to a level of... I wanted to vomit from the fear. Like I I physically was ill from the danger we were in. And that one was tough. That one was like, okay, 
recruit your, <clears throat> you know, your guts here, stay calm, breathe, control your adrenaline, be smart. Um, you know, it was, it was a real test of, uh, of, you know, staying calm and, 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 and getting through it. And I think at the end of that, um, I learned a few things about myself, but I also came to the conclusion that I don't, I'm not doing that again. Like there's a line in the sand, forget it. No, I will say no. For, for those of us that don't know, what the hell are you talking about? What happened? Mm. It wasn't just one thing. Uh, are you just talking about the trip in general and those mountains? Yeah, we took a trip to New Zealand uh, a couple years ago, a few years ago now, and uh, it was in some of the most treacherous, steep Southern Alp country that you could imagine yourself, find, you know, in. The snowbanks were crusty. The steepness was insane. The fall lines weren't there. They were off of cliffs, and uh, we, Brian and I, found ourselves up there chasing tar and chamois and and. Um, trying to uh, pluck these tar off the mountain to haul them back down and break them down. And yeah, it got really, really, really sketchy at times. And we didn't have the best of equipment. Uh, it was our first trip to those Southern Alps. And um, yeah, we, we may do, but there was a lot of mistakes that we, we made that could have bit us, no doubt about it. But you guys figure it out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we found ourselves though in some very, very dangerous situations. I mean, just just the snow given out from under your foot just a little bit, um, and and then you start to slide with a little momentum. There's no stopping. And, that's so and, that's so interesting that you guys say that the the scariest experience I've ever had in the mountains was also in the Southern Alps. For those that haven't been there, it's almost impossible to explain how treacherous it is. It's unbelievable i remember when i got out of the helicopter down there i i was i got chills like i'd never seen anything remotely like that in alaska or rocky mountains or it's it's unbelievable we were in one of those huts and we 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 knew where the goats were we had done this death defying retrieval of ryan's first tar and uh that in itself was just scary as all get out and then we see this laminated map in the hut that shows this pass and it, it makes it look like there's a pass over this mountain that has a little saddle and you go through to the other side and then you're on the other side so we decide we're going to go over to the other side to see what's over there and so we climb this mountain and we go through this pass which was really <laughs> just a knife edge ridge with a hundred foot drops and cliffs and stuff and once you're up there a certain ways there's only going up you can't go back now and it got worse and worse until i mean we could have we could have been seriously injured or or killed from that then we get to the other side and ryan kills a a tar i kill a tar and it falls nicely in this safe spot ryan kills a tar and it falls in a death-defying deadly spot um anyway we end up again, in a dangerous situation, even worse than before. We finally do get this tar though. And, but then we do this night hike down this choked boulder strewn cliffed out river basin. And we don't have enough data to know if we can even go down this thing and get to the hut over there. But we knew we didn't want, we couldn't go back the way we had come. That was impossible. The way we had come through the pass it was just not so we had we kind of got ourselves boxed into this place and then we had to hike out and there was like 30 foot slides down boulder faces you sent your pack down first then you slid down once you were down there there was no going back and the water was treacherous if you fell in it was over your head ice cold and you die in these rapids and i mean the whole thing was just one dangerous moment after another and many people that were experienced in new zealand told us later you know there was a reason no one was there that late in the year that was too deep into winter Mm -hmm. um and they you start to realize that people die in the alps in new zealand all the time like left and right the mountains kill people all the time because 
like us, they, they did something kind of foolish, got themselves into a situation, underestimated the risk and then, and then, uh, were hurt. And so that experience, uh, I still remember feeling like I wanted to vomit, you know, up there being, and I still had a long, we still had to get off that mountain. Um, and it's funny when you're with a friend and Ryan and I are both there, I don't know exactly what was going through Ryan's head. Um, exactly. I was thinking if I die here, my wife is going to be so, so disappointed, you know, (laughs) like she's going to be like my idiot husband and she'll never forgive me. I mean, that was one of the things, but I also sitting there coming off the hill thinking, you know, the whole time, of course, it doesn't do any good to like express your fear in any sincere way. I mean, it was just us making fun of dying. Like you had nothing but humor at that point. Um, There's a lot of laughing at how treacherous it was and, you know, how steep and, and how dangerous it was. It, it's funny. I found myself in those type scenarios a lot, whether it's on the water in a bad storm or in the mountains or in a place like Brian and I were in. And you do get to a point where it's, it's, you start to laugh and I can't ex- explain why but it's just it's it starts to make you just giddy because of how stupid and where you find yourself i wonder if it's your body's natural reaction just trying to calm yourself down i I think it is i've been in those scenarios too i think your your mind is trying to make the situation right and i think you're struggling to not completely lose your shiz so you can still try to make some yeah it's either some of the right decisions yeah either laugh or cry like one of the two Mm -hmm. yeah brian i i I can see so clearly what you're talking about because that that little river basin that you guys had to go down, that's where I felt like I was going to die too. Except I didn't go in the winter. If it had been in the winter, we would have died, or we would have we'd have probably been. I don't know how we'd have survived it, but I went in April, March or April. I was down there, so the snow was gone. But we were on top of the mountain. We were camped down at the bottom of one of those river, dry river basins, the boulders and stuff, and we had hiked up the morning. It was totally clear and sunny. We hunted up there all day, blah, 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 blah. And right, I don't know, an hour before dark, we're like, oh, we should try to find our way back down. It's like, well, duh, you idiots. Um, (laughs) And right then, the thickest fog, like coastal fog, rolls in, just boom, out of nowhere. And uh, we hadn't figured out, because the way we came up, we were not going back down. I mean, we were climbing up like, like, I don't even know what these bushes were, but we were like scaling walls with vines and stuff. It was ridiculous. And there's no way I was going back down that way. Uh, somewhere there's video of this. I got to find it. But we're, we're going through the fog and we find this like dried up waterfall and creek that's like straight down, but it's, there's enough boulders and stuff that you could pick your way down. We were probably 2,000 vertical or 3,000 vertical feet above camp. But we're like, this might be our only chance to get down. And, and uh, Zion, my buddy who is with us and who lives down there, um, he was like calm as the day is long. You know, he's probably been through this multiple times. But I'm like, dude, this is the roughest country I've ever seen. Anyways, yeah. we spent half the night navigating the fog down through this dried waterfall <laughs> and creek bed. And I'm like... Dude, I, I am not a rock, rock climber. I hate that stuff. And uh, it scared the living shit out of me. Now, I don't think we almost died. If there would have been ice, I think we would have almost died. But I definitely can, uh, I feel you guys in that feeling of like, holy shit, this would be a really stupid way to die. Like, uh, I've never really <laughs> been in this position where I, I even in hunting my whole life out west, I've never really felt like I was going to die. Oh. We left Luke Duesenberry back at the huts <clears throat> and he ran into these guys from the Netherlands. I think it was. And these guys are actually experienced mountaineers. We're back there. We're two miles away or more uh, as a crow flies from these guys at the very tip top of this icy mountain. And we're searching for a tar at the time, searching for a tar, <laughs> still hunting. <laughs> and we are like, we are moving like so slow. We're kicking out like platforms and building excavating every step we take we're like toe picking knocking out shelves making a stable stable double checking oh my god then we take a step and then we take a step because if you slide you're dead and we're up there and these guys from the netherlands they go and get luke duesenberry because we left him back at the hut you know and he's with them and he's, they're like, we found your friends. We found your friends. Come, come look at this. And so Luke come, runs over and they look at us through the spotting scope. And the guys from the Netherlands are like, we found your friends. 
they look very, very scared. <laughs> <laughs> From two miles away through a spotter, they're looking at us and they can tell we are scared crapless. <laughs> oh, my hilarious. God. So was that, wasn't that right around the same time that you met Bryce, Brian? Yeah, I had, my time of, I had a pair of Peaks trekking poles. And it's funny, <clears throat> I had been using a pair of Black Diamond trekking poles for like five or six years. And I, I had just left them in the Cassiar Mountains with Dustin Rowe you know, and, and Dennis and Doran and their crew at backcountry BC and beyond. And, uh, I was like, man, <clears throat> I need some new trekkers. And I was climbing the mountain, the Wasatch here. And, uh, it was kind of a cold, I don't remember. It was like winter time. And I, and I texted, uh, I just made a social media post actually and said, Hey, like guys, tell me what, what's your favorite po- trekking poles out there? I'm looking for a good set. Who's got a pair? Who's, who's, you know, what do you recommend? And I got all these responses, but I kept getting all these responses saying, check out peaks, check out peaks. <clears throat> and of course I'm like peaks and some guy is developing these and da, 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 da. And, and uh, of course me being the um, eternal skeptic, I'm like, yeah, no. Give me a brand I recognize, uh, not some loser <laughs> off brand. That and at the time, it was just called Sissy Sticks, right? Yeah, it was called yeah. Sissy, Sissy Sticks, Sticks, which, by the way, was like, that is a deal breaker. My name is Gritty, <laughs> Grit, not Sissy. And so, well, I mean, it depends if you ask Ryan what your name is. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan <laughs> Lampers would probably disagree. Bastam, but Bastam hits me up in the, the DMs or the messages, and he That's says, right. Hey, you know, I go to church with this dude. Uh, he's actually got a legit product. It, it looks like this. You need to check it out. Da, da, da. Um, <clears throat> and somehow or another, I end up, I think, just having messages or a phone call with Bryce. And uh, I was like, sure, you know, send me a poll. I'll give him a shot. I'll, but I, I, I was like, Bryce, <clears throat> I'm sure you're a great guy. <laughs> But um, look, if these things suck, they're just going to suck and I'm not going to promote them. If they're a great product, then I'll promote them. But but um, I'd love to share them. But that's all on you. Send them to me. I am not making you any promises. And so Bryce sent me these polls. And uh, and then I think I got some for you, Ryan. Yes. (laughs) And we end up in New Zealand and we are we are we are putting these polls through the a, ringer i don't think there's pole. i don't think there's any place on the planet where gators and poles can get more tested than in the new zealand southern alps under the the time of year and conditions we were in and uh it was shocking how i mean i was trying to break them from day one like from day one i was just <laughs> just i don't i mean most people who on with me know i I'm very careful with my equipment and I take really good care of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. I dude, I, I, my, if I get a new truck, you know, how guys are like, well, I don't want to drive it through here cause it'll get scratched and I want to be careful and they wash it all the time. I'm not that guy. You get a new truck. I'll have it banged up within a week or two. I feel like if you, if you buy it, you buy it to use it, not to baby it. So I, I beat the hell out of those poles that side by side was new by the way (laughs) that's how that's how we drive amen brother (laughs) i mean that might have a bent rim and an axle pro i don't know we're gonna get it checked out but uh anyway yeah i'm all about uh using stuff to its fullest and so we we go out there and i i beat the heck out of those poles and um i think on the last day I somehow was crossing a creek and I extended the pole way beyond it's where it's supposed to be. You know how that goes. And it's got that thing that says, stop, you know, don't extend it past here. Well, I did, you know, cause this is a test and uh, I jammed that thing in. I don't remember what I did, but I snapped it off. Uh, well, we were crossing a Creek. We were coming out middle of the night, uh, a heavy pack out. We had tar on our back in this new right. terrain and uh yeah you had it well beyond the stop line and you jammed it into the opposite creek bank as you jumped so you ended up yeah breaking it at that point so at that point i don't remember i think i jimmy rigged it back together um 
and found a way to still have it. The extensions work together. And anyway, we hiked mm -hmm. out and I remember going, wow, these poles are impressive. And so at that point I decided, you know, I got back to Bryce and I'm like, all right, you have a product that I can in good conscience recommend anyone get, uh, but you got to change the name, dude. Sissy sticks is killing me. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, from there, a relationship was born. Um, and it was really cool too, because uh, people got the polls and, they loved them. The feedback was solid um, right off the get go. Um, yeah. Bryce, what made you think you can launch an equipment company into the hunting industry with all the saturation? That's that exactly is? what I said. I was like, <laughs> what makes you qualified to make a poll and uh, create this product? The balls on this guy. I'm telling you, <laughs> <laughs> I was I, such an you know, asshole. Yeah. Who are you, man? <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't know what the answer to that really is, Dave, other than just why not, right? Like, well, why can't I do this? And why won't it work? I, I don't see any reason why anyone can't go start a business in any industry and compete with whoever it is. And, you know, to me, it was more of, do can I accomplish this for myself more than it is for, you know, trying to go conquer an industry it was it, it, for me it was a, a way to just prove that i had the capabilities of of building a product that could meet the specific demands of a hunter i had just gotten out of an experience where i had bought a cheap pair of trekking poles at walmart to go on a backcountry hunt with my brother and i don't know we were eight miles in or whatever we killed a bull or we trying to pack it out and i had bent one of those cheap aluminum poles just strictly in half and the whole hike out was just trying to strategize around building a product that would meet the needs of a backcountry hunter and from there it was more I, mean, I was still in a corporate career in the financial services industry and so it was more of like a pet project just trying to tinker around and you know if it ever turned into something great if it didn't then I still had my day job but you know, eventually it got to the point where it was like, this is a pretty viable product. And that's when I really approached Bassam for the first time and took him to, to breakfast and said, look, this is what I'm doing. I think this is going to work. Can you provide some guidance and some help in the, you know, the right approach to launch a business in the hunting industry? And, and it just so happens that like, Right after that, Gritty posts his thing on Instagram saying, I'm looking for trekking poles. So, you know, the stars kind of aligned in regards to the way it all came together, but I just never thought I couldn't do it. And so, because I never had the attitude of this isn't going to work, I kept trying. And I don't know how many prototypes we built that failed. A lot. Um, a lot. <laughs> it, it was, you know, my brother and I were doing the product testing and I can't even tell you how many pairs we broke trying to figure out the right combination of materials and locking systems and heights and everything else before we finally felt like, yeah, this seems pretty legit. But I think that's what is the future, Bryce? Of like, so now you're in it. You're 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 three or four years into this this company. Yeah. Uh, what's the future of equipment and hunting? Obviously, I'm involved in the company too, um, but I'm always interested because you're kind of you're a newcomer into the hunting world. You came from a totally different industry. You have a fresh perspective. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a little jaded. I'm a little tired. Uh, and probably similar across the room here. We've all been doing this a while. You always have this fresh spark. Like, how much opportunity is there out there for companies like yours? You know, any any company that wants to to enter. Like, is the hunting industry growing? Is it what's going on? In yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think the opportunities are are endless. Obviously, but I, I think that in the evolution of of the hunting industry. We've always said that the hunting industry is about 10 years behind where the mountaineering industry is, right? And and the hunting industry has adopted a lot of the equipment that has come out of the mountaineering industry. But I think what's really happened within that 
kind of 10 year evolutionary process is that we've learned that while the mountaineering products are great, they're lightweight, they have been engineered really well, they don't meet the specific needs of a backcountry hunter or a hunter in general. And so I think we've kind of um, adopted a lot of that mountaineering mentality into the way we design and approach product development. But now we're going a step beyond that and saying, okay, yeah, we know we have all these technical fabrics or technical materials that can be used to make equipment, but how does that specifically now need to be applied to meet the needs of a hunter? And so I think the evolution of these hunting companies now is going to be taking these high-end textiles or other materials and learning how to apply them so that they're specific to hunting. Because we all hate more than anything going to REI or wherever and buying the mountaineering product because, well, it's just the best alternative still. And so I think you're starting to start to see a lot of uh, innovation in regards to how these products are built for hunting. I think a, a good example of that, you know, Lampers often talks about his MSR Hubba, which I think he ran that for 10, 20, I don't know, a long time, Forever, long, early nineties. Yeah. And uh, I can recall the same thing. Now we run teepees and stoves for almost every hunt. Um, even in the spring, we used it a lot this year. I don't want to take a Hilleberg dome tent freestanding. I don't want to take a typical mountaineering tent on a hunt yet we did that for generations years where Mm -hmm. that was the lightweight option and it was pretty bomb proof but what a miserable way to spend your hunt when it's raining and snowing a lot compared to how the how comfortable it is now in a teepee and a stove no mountaineer though is going to haul up you know above tree line in in a in a mountaineering scenario a teepee and a stove so they didn't really invent it or leverage it Mm -hmm. that's a hunting thing that's a, that's right. a, that's a hunting deal. And so I think over time, like you said, Bryce, we've evolved to find products and styles that tailor better to hunting than, 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 uh, than the mountaineering did. And as we've taken a lot from the mountaineering space and now we're adjusting to the hunting space, we're getting some really like backpacks too. You know, we pack out a hundred, 140 pound packs. Mountaineers don't do that. They, they get up around, you know, at maximum, I would say probably 80 pounds max, maybe, maybe not even over 60, 65 and, uh, for a 10 day excursion. Well, the problem we run into is we're the same until we kill. Now we need a backpack that does a whole different thing, a whole different load than what a mountaineering pack needs to be able to accomplish and so in those ways we're unique in the hunting space and we need products that meet those needs and stealing from the mountaineering industry doesn't really get the job done and i think the other thing you know the one of the key things that brian just said was you know there and lampers has actually said this a lot he doesn't suffer on the mountain anymore like we used to we used to take these coffin style one man tents and slide into them and be miserable at night. Or we'd use these old textile fabrics for the the apparel that we were wearing or these, you know, really clunky frame backpacks. And it was a pretty miserable experience and you suffered a lot. Garbage bags. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) For your meat sacks. (laughs) Poncho. Um, (laughs) Yep. Whatever. So there's this new mentality now about you don't, you no longer have to suffer in the backcountry, right? I read, uh, I read Cameron Haynes book, uh, backcountry hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a, the equipment list in that is a lesson on how to be the most miserable backcountry hunter on the planet. <laughs> I think he had a bivy sack. He didn't even have a tent. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> everything about that setup and all the gear was the most miserable you can think of. Right. So I, you know, I think now, we're finding ways to just elevate that comfort in the backcountry and enjoy the experience. I, I remember last year when Brandon and I were out hunting, you know, we were on our elk hunt. It was about nine days. I, I looked forward to coming back to the tent at night because I was like coming back to my backcountry home, right? We had, a, we had the, the teepee that we were testing out 
And I could look forward to that time at night where I was just comfortable, spacious, could sit up, had space. I just didn't, it didn't suffer, didn't dread the next day. And then I could rejuvenate myself and, and have the energy I needed for the next day on the mountain. And I think that's the next phase of this hunting journey that we're all on is just finding ways to thrive in the backcountry, thrive on the mountain. Yeah. I think there's a, uh, unfortunately, and I guess fortunately for you, Bryce, as a business owner, there's this ego that still exists because hunting, there's a lot of women that do it. Women, I think is women are the, the number of women hunting is probably growing if I had to guess, but it still is pretty heavy, heavily male dominated and males have this kind of idiotic, uh, mentality of wanting to be tough, right? Like, I mean, do, Brian, you me- mentioned bivy sacks, like they should be in a museum, but it wasn't that long ago. I had friends sleeping on the mountain in bivy sacks. I know. And, and, and I'm always like, what? I had friends sleeping in pu- just a puffy jacket in elk beds. Like, yeah. I'm like, and I've always, I, I'm kind of a creature of comfort. I like comfort. I like, you know, well, I love, love hunting, but it hasn't been... Like, I feel like men are just now getting this point where it's okay to admit you actually like being comfortable, guys, because when you're comfortable, you actually feel better and you're going to hunt harder and well, do better. Comfort be, equals performance. <clears throat> exactly. I was going to say, you're going to be more successful. I mean, you guys were both at Sitka. You, the new textiles and the gear that Sitka had came out with was so revolutionary. It changed everybody's results in the mountains. Mm-hmm. Instead of coming back, <clears throat> you know, off the mountain, Cause you're soaked to the bone and you're on the edge of hyperthermia. <laughs> you were just like bone dry and could just, the rain gear was bomb proof. And, you know, I want to go back to something that Bryce, <clears throat> that we mentioned earlier that, you know, you asked like, how could Bryce, what made Bryce think he could just do this thing? Mm-hmm. You know? And um, I'm going to share a story, probably not supposed to, but I'm going to do it anyway. <clears throat> Bryce is probably like cringing inside. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so we're on the mountain this year and uh, we've been testing every product that, that peaks is developing where the Guinea pigs on. And this is what I want to say. Um, you know, Ryan, how many days in the field are you? There's 365 days in a year. How many days are you, uh, out in the field per year on a, on a year that's pretty intense? Mm-hmm. What's yeah, guess? it's it's well over a hundred days just in hunting, you know, solely hunting trips. Uh, probably 120 days or so, and then there's other days that we're just up there camping and spending time and scouting mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah, so you're talking out of 365 days in a year. I've had times where I've spent over 150 days in the field. <clears throat> some years I've had to cut it back so I can, so my wife doesn't leave me and my kids have a father, but that's a lot of time in the mountains. Okay. A lot of time doing the exact activity that we're building products for that peaks is building products for. And you asked earlier, like, you know, Bryce, what makes you think you can just do this and how do you do it? <clears throat> and I look at some of these companies that come out with products and you would think like, Black Diamond must have some dude out there 150 days, 200 days a year using that product for this use or doing this or doing that. Having been in this space for a while now and playing in it, I don't think that's true. I I think a lot of times these companies come up with a design inside of a building, inside of a room with a bunch of fancy designers and people who, who draft it out on a board. What Ryan and I do with the equipment in the field, how many days we spend just beating the hell out of it and then coming back and reporting what worked, what didn't work, what we want to see changed. You can't, that's hard to buy because when we've figured this out, like we've gone out and we've tested a product like the Gators and we're like, well, we used them on this hunt and we probably put 60 days on them, you know, and we think one thing. Then we put a hundred days on them and we think a different thing about the prototype and we get iteration after iteration and <clears throat> you end up developing stuff i think that c- does compete because you're actually using it for the purpose it was made for in the field there's just no substitute and you can set it up in some wind room like the peaks uh teepee <clears throat> this you know what what sucks about having prototypes is prototypes fail 
And Brian has That's the whole point of prototypes. <laughs> Brian has meltdowns <laughs> when products <laughs> fail. <clears throat> and Ryan can witness them. I've seen them. And, and you know, this year I was running the peaks TP, and the goal is is prototype. Can we break it? Can, what 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 sucks about it? And what, this TP is isn't a, this is something that that Bryce is working on for the future, right? Yeah, people saw it at the Western Hunt Expo this year, and you debate debuted it a little bit. Well, we've been beating it up and beating it up and beating it up. <clears throat> and we we were testing it out and it was just this next videos that drop that are going on the Go Hunt channel. You can see um, Peaks has this really cool design where there's a cr cross member section of trekking poles where you can use your sissy sticks poles in the teepee top, which provides this rigidity to the shelter that I haven't seen in a teepee type structure. You see it in like a Hilleberg with the with the freestanding dome type poles. And this is, this is something pretty cool. Well, we, we get, we get hit with some crazy storms and stuff and it's still standing and we're testing it out, but we had a failure with the pole, the carbon pole, you know, and the cold pole broke, which made the teepee shorter because the pole, <laughs> I had to salvage the pole. And <clears throat> I was having, I was so pissed off that this pole failed. <laughs> and, and then I'm like, rebuilding poles out of wood logs and like make shifting, finding ways to make this thing still stand. And anyway, all of that pain that comes from testing prototypes in the real world translates into a final product that we have extreme confidence in. And you don't get that unless you, unless you pay the price and you use it in the field. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's hard to go from something tried and true to a prototype when you're trying to succeed in the mountains, because mm -hmm. it can really impede your success on the actual hunt itself. Mm -hmm. But that's the whole point of, and, and the challenge in building products for this industry. But that's a perfect example of, I think why Bryce has been able, one of the reasons Bryce has recruited the right people to, to help on like both Dave and Bass Ham both come from Sitka that, I mean, talk about one of the pinnacle brands in the hunting industry. They come from there. They, they know a lot about the ins and outs of business in this space. Bryce, you manage to forge those relationships. Ryan and I, we spend most of the year outside and we, we beat the hell out of this stuff when we come back and we're able to say, ah, this isn't, this isn't right. This, this has an issue. And you're able to then, you don't sit there like this isn't the, this, you're not the only company that we work with. And what's kind of shocking is we go back to companies we work with and we say, Hey, look, <clears throat> this strap or this thing isn't working or that thing's a problem. And they go, Oh, cool. Thanks. And they don't change it. <laughs> like, it's like, <laughs> look, this is like, we're just be, we're just talking into the wind, yelling into the wind. And Bryce, you can take that product and you're not ego about it. You have no ego involved. You just go, oh, Okay. All right. And you go back to the drawing board and you come back with something that I won't cuss you out about on the next trip. Yeah. And, I, you know, Brian, I think it's such what I was going to say real quick, Bryce, is coming from Bass Ham and I have been through this for quite a while now um, with multiple brands. But your your comment around most products are designed by people with fancy degrees on whiteboards and in offices with cubicles is 100% correct. And it's not super sexy to talk about and it might piss people off, but that is the absolute truth, especially as companies get really big or bigger. Right. The the when you're young it's easy. Like I'll be be honest, Bryce has it pretty easy right now because it's still a small company, very nimble, less opinions, less 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 money, risk, all the all the things, Investors. right? Yeah. Investors as, as you get big, it doesn't matter what company we're talking about, it, it becomes much harder to do what you just described because the priorities change, the people change, people become and brands become complacent about how products are developed. We won't get into that, but I can tell you for a fact what you said is true. And it is when, when, you, when that tent pole failed and you called Bryce, I will tell you that that actually is the first time I've ever seen him shaken up about anything like this. Um, and what I said to him was, 
This is exactly why we're doing. This is the whole point. Is if if it is to find the identify these problems. Yes, it's a sacrifice for you and uh, Ryan, which which is hard and does suck. But that's the whole point of us doing it this way. I mean, we could easily just flip out the first design to market and try to make money off of it and probably sell some of them. But that's no way to make products for for the end consumer and these hardcore hunters. They want us to to have these stories because then they they, they know that we are actually trying to get these things to fail so we can make them as good as possible right um and you know slap we're, we're gonna we're gonna really give Br bryce the runaround if we ever see him just sitting in a cubicle not sending <laughs> these things out to test and not not actually uh, allowing for things to fail and and being willing to stop right that tent that teepee is a good example we showed it at western hunter which was in february that was you know six yeah. months ago and we had uh, uh, Peaks was going to launch it in I think July right. or August. Right now, a wrench uh, uh, at, at the show is that I think that's what um, the the communication was. The reason that it hasn't is because Bryce and the team, through Brian and Ryan and and others, is uh, trying to perfect it and and fix those 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 points of failure so that it actually is right when it does come out. And that's admirable. That's nothing to be embarrassed about. No, I was yes, going to say that I, I have a... Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was going to say, to reiterate what Brian was saying about Bryce, like one of the one of the many good things about Bryce is, uh, and I find it funny, like whenever Brian and I have an issue on the mountain and I pull out my little Garmin, I can tell Brian, I'm like, oh, Bryce is going to be... I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna feel his emotion through his texts. Uh, he's going to be stressing <laughs> out about this one. So, you know, I'll message him a problem. And the good thing is... He takes every little message so seriously that he hops right on it. Like he's he's addressing the problem immediately and he's gonna figure it out. And he's discussing it with everybody at the office mm -hmm. too, guys. Like it's 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 awesome because we're all on this car right now doing this, but like those little in reach texts that go to Bryce, then oh, they're like to Brinker and I bombs, and then it's like, let's <laughs> scramble, let's figure this out. We can do it. Oh my my, uh, oh my, my, my phone's ringing, Lampers must have sent another in reach. It's such a love hate relationship. <laughs> Cause I love the fact that I can give these guys products and that I yeah. know I'm going to get honest feedback as to what's wrong with it and what needs to be improved on it. But I hate, hate with a passion getting those texts <laughs> because I know that it's going to push the launch date back by another three months, another six months, another year. I mean, the reality is we were hoping to launch a TP a year ago. Right. I mean, when we first started thinking about this project, we thought we could launch it last fall um, and it wasn't quite ready. And we decided to do a little more testing on the fabrics and everything. But it just I, I, it's so invaluable. I mean, I've, I, I value what Brian and Ryan do for this brand so much and their willingness to go and risk their own success on the mountain to to test these products what most people don't realize bryce and actually we talked about this yesterday on a on a separate call is and i'm when i say most people most consumers don't realize for the great brands that are out there the sitkas the kuyus the whatevers there are so many more failures than successes like i i can think back through all the projects we worked at sitka i was at sitka for 11 years and i can think back to the the pro the product projects like the big projects are big swings. I remember the first huge one we had was when we launched the heated vest that we did in uh, <laughs> two thousand and nine. It was called the uh, oh shit no the Dutch oven is what it was Dutch called. Oven. Dutch oven. And uh, I think I can't remember how many we ordered, maybe a five hundred or a thousand or something like that. And we showed them at Shot Show, and it was just off the hooks. Everybody's talking about this heated vest. Oh my God, we've been waiting forever. And we partnered with this new and upcoming startup for batteries. And it was so cool. It was so exciting. Um, and then we launched it and people got burnt, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to do like, I mean, and here we are. We're like six guys in a room, right? I mean, that's, right. that's where Sitka was at the time, maybe 10. And we have to do a, a recall. <laughs> and uh, that's really scary. But what I, I we had pr pretty big balls, I guess, back then. To like, we I don't know how much testing we did on that. To be, I, I can't remember all the details. But then when I think through 
the years after that, we learned a pretty big lesson there. It's like, dude, if you're going to make a lot of noise about something and make a lot of claims, it better damn well be pretty rigorously tested by, and not that we didn't test it, but you know, I, I, it was, it was definitely a failure. But then I think about like of the top 20 projects we worked on in my time there, I bet you we actually delivered to market a quarter of those because we were, we were willing to kill them. We were absolutely willing to kill them. Like two take, years in, shoot take, it in the head and be done. Yep, yeah, take it out back, shoot it in the head, and bury it. Yeah. And we did that so many times, like, way more times than we actually launched something. Yeah. Um, and I just don't think a lot of people have. Well, just because by nature, most people don't work in any industry like that. But that is for the great brands out there. Now, for the mediocre brands, they probably just launch whatever. But for the great brands, if you want to be great, there is a lot of skeletons in the closet that never got out, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say this about uh, about uh, you, Dave, and Ryan Bassham. Um, you know, Ryan and I use tons of gear, and we 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 know what the pinnacle products are in this space. We, we've used everything, and we we have our opinions, and you know, we can disagree with other people, but we know what the top three, top five you know, shelters, stoves, uh, a backpack, so on. And, um, you know, as we discussed coming out with gators or poles or this teepee, right. Um, we know we could pretty much, we know what the top one is. We could just copy it. You see companies do that all the time. There's patents and there's other things that are out there that, that restrict you to a degree. But in large part, a lot of this stuff, that's you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's there. But one of the things that uh, you two gentlemen have brought to the table and Bryce probably to uh, the idea is don't bring it to the market unless it performs, you know, as far as reliability and so forth, at least you know, with the competitors, but more than that, don't bring it to market unless it's different, unless it has unique and, and appreciable differences. Otherwise um, you're just kind of copying what everyone else is bringing. And some of the innovation I think that has come out of, um, out of the few products that are out there right now, from the headlamp to the poles, to the gators, to this prototype TV that's, that's in the works very very they're all distinct compared to whatever what everyone else is creating and that's pretty cool um especially like in i, I can think of the tp it's very very different than everything else i've seen and have been using for a while um and so uh it's pretty cool it's really cool to see that hey it's not just let's just not make something that's a twin of what everyone else is making that's reliable but let's also innovate yeah, absolutely. And sometimes those innovations may be small, you know? Right. Um, I think this industry more often than not gets way over its skis and tries to do too much, too many things where if you, if you meet and really dig into a personality, especially with like lampers, right? If you look like really thoughtfully at, at, at what he has in his backpack and what he uses it's not always like the sexiest bells and whistles, right? What he wants is something that works and nothing more. Like I don't need, a, a, you know, don't just add a pocket to add a pocket. Don't just add a bell or a whistle, just add a bell or whistle and charge more for it. It's like, I need something that outperforms the rest, but that's enough. That's enough. Stop. Otherwise that's where failure points start coming in. Right? Yeah. Like I, I look at, I look at you guys and your system. Like I really enjoyed our time on the mountain this year, Brian in Colorado, when we got to spend, you know, till three in the morning hiking around in the thorns. Um, <laughs> <laughs> great discussions happen. And, but you get to go when you spend that time and we're like, you know, uh, building a fire and dumping gear everywhere and going through all, you, you get to analyze what everybody has in their backpacks and learn on the mountain mm -hmm. You know, and every single time I do that, I realize because I'm hyper, I'm trying to pay hyper attention to it, how thoughtful a really good system on the mountain is, but it's not too much and it's yeah. not too little. It's just the, it's just tweaked just perfectly. Does that make sense? It's like a fine tuned. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think of that recent um, debut of the uh, I don't know, like the onesie sleeping bag thing. You know, the one somebody came out with. Um, Sitka came out with a, this. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sitka sleeping bag. What was it? It's, what's what's it called? I don't. It's I don't a know. little over over engineered, uh, in my opinion, right? And I think that's a perfect example where maybe some of those innovations would have been nice, but it just was like, whoa, just went a little too far. The, the way it strings up between your legs looks like a set of these nuts and stuff. Like, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I, you know, I think it's functional, um, but I, I um, yeah. I it's, think, hard, it's hard to know where that line is sometimes, yeah, especially yeah. when you're a company you know, like Sitka that's that's so big and they have the resources to to basically do whatever they want, right? Um it, and I can tell you from working inside those companies, it is it is challenging to know where that line is because you almost get to the point where you think you can do anything. Like yeah. it doesn't matter what we do. We could Yeah. I, I, I could throw the 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 altitude show logo on a toilet seat and sell it, you know. Yeah. But uh it's there's not, also that pressure to continue to do that stuff too. It's like right. It's multiple things, right, Dave? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, we all give, we all give those brands a really hard time when they miss the mark. I would I would say, but there's important lessons in there when when companies really take the time to um, over engineer or, or innovate beyond maybe what the market's ready for. It opens the door for other brands to get more experimental and maybe not quite go that far but still bring to market something that is really needed look and, i, re- I remember i remember vividly when we launched the first mountaineer-esque sitka film and it was called searching for west and it was with uh, mark seacat produced it um it was in like 2000 and nine ish i was gonna say 2009 yeah ish yeah and this that... was at a time that was like the mountaineering industry was heavy in like films and great content and beautiful and all these things where the hunting industry at this time was still like red flannels, car hearts, back of the channel. Yeah. Back of the yeah, truck I, tongue hanging out. I'm curious what you're going to say here. Cause I have strong opinions <laughs> on that's fine. I, what I'm going to say is, is, is exactly what Bryce just said. So when we launched that, it was the first film in this industry that I know of that had no kills, not even that barely any animal footage, but it actually did pretty well, and I, I took a lot of heat on in, behind the doors on pr- producing that film with Mark because of that, because it was so different. It was kind of, we were, we were probably a bit over our skis for the time, but my, my response at the time, and, I, and I, I was right, was it was the beginning of a whole new thought process of content in this industry. And I think it spurred a lot of thought that actually brought the the industry a little bit more up to the times on producing content that wasn't so redneck. Now, was the film good or bad? You, everybody can have their opinion on it, and I want to hear yours, Brian. But um, <laughs> I've actually only I've only seen it one time, so I'll be honest with you guys. But the 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 point of it was we changed the industry at that point with with gear and content, and it I believe that it, it, it sort of started a new era where it allows, it's almost like where crypto just tanked, right? Mm, yeah. Someone has to go out there and like take too much risk and totally bite the dust. And then people figure out how to do it right. And then all of a sudden we're going to have new coins that actually succeed, right? I, I look at that era the same way. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Brian. Well, I'm a f- film junkie, you know, when it comes to especially documentary style hunt type films. Um, I, I truly appreciate nature, the outdoors and them being filmed and, and shot well. And so my, and my thoughts on the film were, I was, I was watching it and I was blown away. The introduction, the, the sounds, the sound of the chainsaw, the tree falling, the silence in the film, the, 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 the lack of music. Like I hate films with tons of music in them. Like you can tell from my style, sometimes I put no music in, in an hour long film I make when you're outside, I want to hear the outside, the microphones, the audio was spectacular. I mean, they, these guys 
uh, crush me when it comes to how to run a camera and capture sound and, and, and the edit was good. It was clean and it was really nice. And still I watched the movie seeing all these like epic changes. And then I didn't really see any animals at all. And then I saw a guy that wimped out and went home early and didn't kill an elk. And I sat there going, WTF, what did I just watch? I, I, I was like mixed emotions. I was angry in the results um, and, and how that happened and, and the decision to go home uh, and not get an elk. And I was, but I was like, it's super, the story's real. It's real enough, you know, and it was shot and filmed spectacularly. So I felt like it was, it, this, the film itself, it's hard to, technically it's hard to fault, but the actual message in the end result was a real letdown. So I had really mixed emotions. I have probably watched that movie 10 times, watched it because of the cinematography and because of what it brought to the table and how the art of the filmmaking took place. But I felt like the actual story let me down and yeah. it was just disappointment. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, it definitely. I mean, the, the still to this day, I mean, it's been, what, th- you know, 13 years or something. The, the editing and the cinematography and some of the camera work is still pretty. It's, I mean, it could be launched right now from that perspective and still be up there. Right. Like it was re- it was done very well. But I, I hear you for sure. Um, at the time. You know, that was, and I'm not, and I'm not against people putting out a film where they're not successful. Ryan and I have done that a number of times. That's, that's life. That's how it goes. But, but it was sort of the, the, uh, the way it was presented mm-hmm. in terms of the reasons for leaving and all of that. We all feel that way right. at times. We just tough it out and make it happen. And it felt like with the production that was there, it just wasn't right to then leave it ending the way that it did. Like they didn't match. Right. You know, that was a lot of effort for, for that sort of result. And yeah, the- for sure. Uh, I think what's interesting though, is just about everybody knows about it. And yeah. there's been thousands yeah. of films launched in the time period. Since, so yeah. I think in that, that's kind of my point is, yeah, it was groundbreaking. That's right. And, and uh, at the time, you know, and I'm not, I, I have my own opinion. My opinions don't matter. I I've heard all kinds of opinions on the film, but the point of it was at the time, you know, instead of drones, we were renting helicopters instead of, you know, (laughs) instead of mirrorless Sony's that don't weigh much. We were, the people were carrying like a red camera and a phantom camera that shoots, you know, so it was gold standard. Like, yeah, it was a, it was limiting. It was tough to get a public land archery elk, you know, for, Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. But I, the point- I remember watching uh, Rivers Divide mm-hmm. around. Uh, that was right around the same time, maybe same a couple time. years later. And, yeah. it, and those were quintessential moments that um, ch- changed uh, the, the hunting industry to me. Um, yeah, the Rivers Divide it. was a. I mean, in this industry is is definitely up there as one of the top films. And Donnie, Donnie, you know, we could talk about all his work but again that was another example of having the balls to go out ahead of the industry Mm -hmm. and uh i think i think the whole point and the whole message is is i admire what you're doing bryce i think you've assembled an amazing team and i i admire that you you are uh have the balls and are willing to actually read those delorme messages from ryan and brian (laughs) <laughs> and in the middle of the night text me that we need to talk because <laughs> you need therapy um you know you could just as easily delete them and be like i'm gonna do whatever i want because i'm a businessman and i got my profit margins and blah 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 so i i'm really excited about what you're doing and it's great to have you even though i'm kind of one one leg in and one leg out of the industry now i kind of go back and forth between multiple industries um, it's, it's good to have more good people because it's such a good industry and it's, it's, yeah, I love seeing brands crush because I know there's so much, op- we think that the, everything yesterday, another example, uh, Brian, your hat, initial ascent. I really like those guys. I, I personally wear a stone glacier backpack. 
I'm friends with those guys. I met the initial ascent guys at Western Hunting Expo. I really, really like those guys. Yesterday, I've been watching them on TikTok, and I've never tried this, but yesterday they posted a video of, did you guys see this where they're hanging bags on the side of the frames? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're doing it at the expo too. It was really cool. Oh, yeah. were they doing that there? I, yeah, I, I, they were I was, doing it there, yeah. I was too busy drinking Ignite and walking back and forth talking to Bryce. <laughs> uh, but, okay, so I've never tried that. I don't know if I'd like it or not. But the idea that there's still mountains to conquer and carrying loads. And the other thing I saw was that front pack from whatever company that was. Never tried it. Don't know if it works that well. I have a friend that tells me that it's the bee's knees and he'll never put another load on his back. Mm. And I kind of trust what he says too. The point of it is, is like there's still innovation to be had and it's exciting, right? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I think that's something that if, if your desire and passion is deeply embedded into what your pursuit is in this industry, you're always going to sometimes even on accident, um, come up with these new innovative ways of creating a product or creating an experience for this community or whatever it may be, um, even in regards to content creation. And I think that just comes for, from the love of the game. So I do speak. have to know, are we going to ever see Ryan Lampers carrying out an elk with a front pack? I mean, at this point, since I haven't tried one, highly not. Well, it's not likely at all. <laughs> uh, I am I am pretty in love with my Stone Glacier pack, uh, <laughs> just like you, Dave. But uh, you never know. We'll see. We'll see. What, okay. What okay. Through. Brian. Brian, are you are you are you willing to try it? Me? Yeah. Oh, I'm the eternal skeptic. I will put it on and try to find every reason to hate it. <laughs> um, and, and then if for some reason I'm shocked, I do not give a crap what people think I will just, I will use it. But, uh, if it, uh, if it doesn't, you know, if it, it doesn't live up to some of my expectations, you'll all get my un unfiltered opinion. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, you guys are awesome. I think we've, uh, we've done about two hours here. And uh, any final words of wisdom from the room? I've got a couple. I had a couple of good takeaways. This is a good conversation, guys. Um, We talked about a lot of things, but um, I think what's really stuck with me, Dave, is, you know, we talked about how important it is to, especially like early in your career, for those of you listening that are maybe teenagers or in your 20s or even still your early 30s. Man, we, we've talked about Kayim a few times. Like he is that example right now of somebody just quietly in the background working his tail off, learning as much as he can. And then you got guys like Bryce that are on the different end of that spectrum where perseverance, like don't take no for an answer, follow your dream. Um, their, their stories, I don't want Kayim to listen to this, but like Kayim's story and what he's doing now and what Bryce is doing are inspiring. Like watch guys like that, surround yourself with people like that. Um, and you're going to be a better person for it. And I think, uh, from the business perspective, it's been fun to having those discussions today. It's been really cool. Yeah. I would like to say that, um, I kind of got swept along, like, like the, the person who puts out a video and it goes viral and all of a sudden they get popular overnight. That's what it felt like with Greedy Bowman. Like one day, nobody knew my name. And the next day I'm sitting down having lunch with David Brinker getting recruited. Ooh, that's, 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 that's some, that's some, t- <laughs> A, that's a level celebrity there seriously like at the time david that was so wild you, you're flying me there i'm sitting down and dude and i cold offering... called you i cold called i remember i was in the i was in the minneapolis airport when i called you yes and like, that was flattering it was exciting like all these opportunities just happened and what i'll say is um i you realize in every industry that there are there are uh, sharks and and takers and then there are generous people there are givers and it took me a little while to figure out who was who and as Kayim comes up and other people come up like you said Bassham those of us like I was a pretty trusting naive uh, individual at that time very much um, uh, liked everyone and there wasn't really anybody I thought that you know, was, was someone I should avoid or be careful around or including companies. 
Um, and now I look back and what I feel like I've been able to do now is surround myself with not just uh, talented people, but people that have uh, immense levels of, of loyalty, immense levels of integrity. And I think as you navigate this space, you know, whether it's in this industry or any industry, you know, do your best to, to be careful, like do your best to make sure that you are associating with the kind of people that you really want to emulate that you really can trust and trust is such a big deal. And uh, I just feel great where I'm at in life right now. You know, Ryan, Ryan is super judgy, like super quick to judge someone like, and he's annoyingly accurate. So he meets someone within a few minutes, he can kind of determine whether that person is someone we should avoid or someone to <laughs> spend time with. <clears throat> and I don't have that ability. Like I, I don't really have it that good. Like I just like people. Ryan probably would rather spend more time alone than with individuals. And so, but he's really adept at that probably to his detriment at some times where he casts someone aside that he shouldn't uh, mm -hmm. judges them too quickly. But um, it's been great to partner with Ryan and do more and become close friends because I can, I can lean on Ryan. Who's much better at judging people's um, motives and character than I am. And uh, Ryan can be, can pretty much cut through the crap really quickly where it might take me months of hanging out with someone or weeks to hang out and visiting and to start to see the signs, Ryan can pick it out pretty much right off the bat. <laughs> superpower. Hmm. I don't know if that's a superpower or a weakness. I would say probably more of a weakness, but uh, no, I, I appreciate that. No, I'm, I'm humble just to be around the group of guys. You know, I've always, I've talked about this many times about, you know, I'm, I'm not a people person. Uh, I'm not, I'm not an extrovert like Brian, you know, uh, I like less eyeballs, the less eyeballs, the better, which is, you know, interesting when you, when you see, you know, what I'm doing with Brian at this point where he's got a camera literally two inches from your face. Um, I'm just not comfortable with that, but I think, you know, Brian and I make a great team uh, on the mountain. These videos have been incredibly fun. I think they've been very educational for people. Um, Brian's skills, um, I think they're unmatched out there in the hunting industry. They're incredible. But um, yeah, we, we hunt together because I don't say much. And Brian says a lot, like, <laughs> a lot. So he keeps the story going and I, I'm a good listener. So it works really well. And a killer. <laughs> That Bryce, a killer. And a Bryce killer. any parting words of wisdom? No, I, I mean, these guys have said it all, right? I, I, but I, I do want to dovetail, I think, off of what Brian just said. Like, for me, I feel like in, in this group and in the other people that we work with, like, inferior to every single one of, of you as individuals. Like, I, I think that you all are much better at, at – your areas of expertise than I am. And all that does is elevate my desire, my drive to try to be better than I currently am, because I know that you guys are at such a higher level than, than what I am. And so I, the advice I would give, you know, to anybody is just, if you're going to start a business, if you're going to build a group, if you're going to do whatever, pick people that number one, like Brian said, have super high integrity and whose values align with whatever your values are. And then just number two, like pick people who are better than you because it's going to force you to be better at whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. And um, that's why I just feel so blessed to have somehow convinced you guys and others to join this group <laughs> because I, there's no way I could do what we've done on my own. Each one of you have contributed incredibly to the success of peaks and um for that i'm eternally grateful and i just think that if somebody else is going to go try to replicate that in any way they need to just make sure that they're picking the right people because that makes all the difference well i appreciate all of you guys coming on today um for those that want to check out bryce's brand peaksequipment.com can't say enough about the good work that everybody's doing there um 
obviously check out the gritty films he's like i mean when you met me at that lunch i was like a, a d minus celebrity in the hunting industry you're like you're like an a pluser now buddy so like i'm i'm honored to have lunch with you and then uh lampers is obviously in all of gritty's stuff but he also has his own brand of uh what's your website stealthy yeah well we got multiples so yeah stealthyhunter.com will get you there uh okay. we do gosh we do the hunt harvest health um yeah hunt harvest health supplements uh different types of gear all kinds of cool stuff his wife is a genius uh i'm i'm gonna be putting out an episode with her very shortly she's she's amazing they do everything together western hunting summit ryan's been putting on these western hunting summits the last four or so years years. and uh they're absolutely incredible if you can even get lucky to get a spot there because i'm sure they sell out pretty quickly uh for next year they do them in june they they'll start selling them this winter i imagine spots for next year pretty soon Um, actually and uh those are all amazing mr bass ham uh you know you're involved with trophy expeditions your your family's company around booking uh, a booking consultant for hunts all over the world again if you're watching the video i don't even know what kind of pelicans and stuff i'm seeing behind him but like it doesn't matter what you want to hunt in the world ryan would be the first phone call someone texted me the other day and said hey i want to hunt in hawaii for axis deer i said call ryan because he he has all the all the folks plus he's a uh inspiring dude to be around he's really positive and always has a smile on his face and a really gross mustache if you like mustaches maybe it's not you know i i'm just giving you crap ryan they're very in right now i mean you you could fly a fighter jet but i mean you could have been on top i might i mean you know what's stopping me right could you do the could you do the beach scene though when they're playing football Um, i could do the dad bod version it would be pretty awesome um some chicks dig it my wife seems to like it so yeah Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Appreciate all you guys. Let's do this again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Brigger. Thanks,